Hello and welcome to our final post-testing show and this time we're going to take a deep dive to try and understand just how some of the teams performed last week. I'm Martin Lee and I'm joined firstly by our man Jonathan Noble. How are you? All good. Finally getting some uh, bit of sleep after the test. So um, batteries recharging, ready to rock again in a few days. And a first for this channel, our special guest, former performance engineer for Red Bull and Force India. These days I'm used to watching his videos online and his podcasts blake hensey welcome along blake how you doing good well for those that don't know you have your own youtube channel uh, break f1 with three r's uh, you have your buy me a coffee page you have your podcasts which run well over an hour i learn loads from it uh, just listening to those and watching them you can watch them online as well tell us a bit more about your move into content creation yeah, so, I mean, after 10 years of being a trackside performance engineer, um, so six of those were at the track, four years in the simulator Red Bull Racing, I decided uh, 10 years was enough and I wanted to do something else. And initially the move was kind of like, I want to do gaming content, but I couldn't get away from it, honestly. You know, it's just like, you know, in my in my weekends, I was like, right, fire up the Python API, look at the data again. And, and I really couldn't get away from it. I was like, you know what? Why don't I just do a, a bit of that and keep doing that? Because it was, it's you know, it was... A passion turned into a job, and now it's kind of a passion again, and I get to enjoy that and uh, sit back and put a little bit of context and have really interesting discussions with a lot of people on the internet about that, because one of the things about Formula One engineers is they usually get sucked into the machine, and they stay there their entire lives, and so they can't really tell any of these stories, I mean, you know, and a lot of the time they, they can only tell the press certain things, but I think with a bit of uh, hindsight and a bit of context... Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting stories that we can tell, especially now that we've got access to all sorts of telemetry data to really dig deep into what the teams are doing, what they're trying and uh, when things go right and when they go wrong and what they actually look like. Oh, it's a real privilege to have you to explain to us today. Like you say, you are fresh, reasonably fresh from Formula One. Uh, so you have all of that recent knowledge. You've pulled together your top five standout performance stories from last week's testing. So let's dive straight into it. Is it bad news or is it good news for Alpine? For McLaren, we think it's more likely to be uh, bad news. Can you run us through your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, if you in winter testing, if you're fast, it rarely means anything because you can pull some fuel out and everybody's running, you know, mid fuel loads and it's not that impressive. But when I see a team on the back foot the entire weekend or for, or for the entire test week, you're kind of scratching your head thinking, what's going on? You know, McLaren looked visibly frustrated, losing a lot of track time. Uh, with the lowest mileage of any team out there. And then you you move on a little bit further up the road from them and you see Alpine with the second lowest mileage and, you know, discussing before this, which what looks like really strange run plans, you know, doing no proper low fuel running, doing no race simulations of any note. And you're thinking, you've got three days in Bahrain before you go to this race, before you embark on the 2023 season. Are, are you not missing a bunch of... Uh, very important data points so it's hard to say them going from you know alpine specifically going from challenging for fourth to being potentially on the back somewhere maybe not all the way at the back but i'm scratching my head still because the the data tells me one thing um and there's other stuff people are quite confident they're going to be doing well so i really don't know what to say about that 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 is that is the biggest head scratcher for me John, by the time people watch this and listen to it, uh, you, they may have read an article that you've done a, a, about Alpine and trying to decipher their test. Are you as pessimistic as Blake? I don't think I'm pessimi as pessimistic. I think it, thing is it's a bit of a mystery because th there is this disconnect between the stats. When you dig into the, the runs they did, there wasn't the low fuel run. There wasn't the, the kind of long runs that we were seeing other teams doing. There's a lot of short runs, a lot of variation. The reliability wasn't great. So you'd think it was a poor test for them. But then you speak to Otmar Safnau, you speak to Matt Harmon. They're cautiously optimistic. They think that the week's gone to plan. I mean, Alpine is a team that always runs heavy fuel anyway. Last year's winter testing, it was well below the radar. And it you know, emerged those, those first few races, you know, potentially in Australia, gunning for pole. So it's done this in the past. Uh, Matt Harmon says they were doing a lot of setup experiments, a lot of understanding the mechanical aspects of the car, trying to put the car almost out of the right setup window to know where the limit was with ride heights, uh, understand the new suspension system. I think they were running low on engine modes. Maybe when they were running high fuel, they had it in low engine modes and vice versa. So they seem confident. I mean, we did, we did put it to Matt at the end of the test. You know, it's one thing thinking, you know, how quick you can go, but surely at some point you've got to take the fuel out, you've got to turn the engine mode up and you've got to know how quick your car can go. 
But he was adamant, says, we know what the data says. We know where we should be if we take out X amount of fuel or run in X engine mode. So they're cautiously optimistic. There's no, there's no signs like you get from McLaren, for example, that they're on the back foot. So, I mean, we'll find out in FP1, especially when they've got this big upgrade coming. Blake, can you explain what a team means when they say that missing, missing their efficiency targets? What is that? Yeah, so I think that was one of the things that's been, we've, we've had, I've seen a couple of articles talking about McLaren missing the efficiency targets. And that usually comes in one of two forms. The first of those is you basically run a bunch of simulations varying these parameters, such as your lift and drag or your lift over drag ratio. And you try to find the sweet spot for the whole season. And then you build a couple of wings or rear wings for your car that kind of cover that range. So they'll cover, you know, your Monaco and Singapore, and they'll cover your Monzas and Spas. But if you have some fundamental underlying models wrong, let's say a tire model or the driver model as one, or, you know, or you've mispredicted your drag, which I'll get back to, you can come up with a, a overall drag level of your car, which is super inefficient. And we've seen last year, McLaren spent a lot of time uh, at the low end of the speed trap which was peculiar because that was a standout for the Mercedes powered cars. Then if you look at this year and they're saying we've we've probably missed that, another possibility is measuring drag in the wind tunnel is actually extremely nuanced and there's lots of things that you know you can miss in the data and the whole thing that we keep talking about from last year to this year is making your tools match reality and all the assumptions you have to make it's not it's not a perfect science and teams will get it wrong. Um, Mercedes being caught out the most last year with the porpoising phenomena and then having quite a narrow operating window that they couldn't move away from. The same thing could have happened with um, McLaren, potentially it's either a simulation result or uh, a nuance with actually measuring the drag in the wind tunnel. And they show up at the track again and they're, they're scratching their heads thinking, we're missing four kilometers an hour. And then your final thoughts on Alpine, because John mentioned some short stints and t- at some point you've got to take the fuel out and see if you've got pace in the car. You were concerned as well about not even really seeing race simulations what's the problem with not doing that at testing well this is this is their first opportunity to try all six of the new compounds you know or all six of the compounds we have some of them we know there's the new one of course but you know you don't really understand you know the car's balance and everything else so they're they're talking about a lot of these new suspension systems they're working with and we saw the car quite a bit out of shape which they didn't seem too alarmed about but um how does your car what is your compromise in terms of how fast you can go and how long you can sustain that pace and uh if you don't know that, I mean, you could say, yes, you know, if we take 60 kilos out of the car, we'll be close to the front or, you know, third row, right? But without doing it, there's there's no simulations you can run that you can do to predict your pace. And that's why you see teams last year. You saw it happen to Red Bull in Austria. You saw it for Ferrari for the second half of the season. You cannot, there's no models that predict that. You have to observe it. And it, it's nuanced. And there's a lot of things that are uncertainties. And they don't have that data yet. Anything you want to chip in, John, before we move on? I mean, Alpine, it just reminds me of 12 months ago completely. They had a terrible test in Barcelona. Um, I think it was cut short by a, a kind of fuel line fire. Um, the DRS wasn't working. They were super heavy on fuel. And everyone wrote them off 12 months ago. And they kind of there was this bounce back. So, th- I mean, that confidence inside the team. I mean, I think teams know if they're in trouble or not. And I don't think if they felt they're in trouble, they'd be talking about being cautiously optimistic and quietly confident. So, we'll... But, We'll find out in a few days' time. Okay, let's get on to Blake's second point that you want to talk about, and that is Ferrari. How did you see their test performance? Ferrari was an interesting one because, you know, I'm looking at the data from, let's say, when it's day two, I'm looking at the day one data and watching the test in the background, and I don't really feel like Ferrari ever featured in many of the discussions. We're we're looking at the car. It looks great. Uh, It looks pretty reasonable. Nobody looks too flustered, but... You know, they just got on with a pretty standard program, like a mix of, you know, hybrid runs where you go, you know, a performance lap into an extended run. It looked normal. They got lots of mileage. Nope. I just, I didn't hear anything about it. But two two things that stand out to me. Uh, their low fuel pace looks okay. And when, when they're in the mix, it's hard to say. You know, maybe they've got 10, 15 kilos more to pull out of the car. There's a couple tents. So very well could be fighting for the front row. Uh, my gut feeling says I think they might still be a little bit on the recovery, but I'm, I'm, I cannot wait to be surprised. Um, but the, the thing that bothered me a little bit about looking at their car was uh, their high fuel performance, especially at the start of their race simulations. Their degradation looked quite bad, and that was a, a bit of a carryover from last year, especially at the end of the season. So after we came back from the summer break, 
um, both Carlos and uh, Charles were talking about, you know, the tires are overheating. It's fronts, it's rears, it's both axles at the same time. And I, I the only question mark I've got in my head is the 2023 front construction. They've obviously probably have come out with a stiffer front tire to give more grip that was difficult for teams to remedy with setup alone. The only question mark I have is, is that going to push Ferrari further into a bad spot? They've got typically quite a pointy car, um, which is great for single lap, but is that going to hurt their race pace? Their race simulations, especially the first stint when they're heavy on fuel, didn't look spectacular. So that's that's my caution for Ferrari. I think their single lap pace is good. Looking at their through lap performance, high speed, medium speed, low speed, good grip, great high speed performance, and decent traction on a single lap. What does that look like? What does that look like 10 laps, 20 laps into um, a stint when you're at 80 kilos of fuel? So when you say you're concerned about their long runs, is that specifically, you talk about um, degradation on the tyres there? Absolutely. So how much lap time they lose per lap? You know, and it's always that compromise. And you saw it a lot last year and teams talked about it. Do you hit the first stint very fast and deal with the degradation that you get? Or do you try to ease the tires into it? And I think that's the compromise. And they could have been playing with that. They could have deliberately hit some of those heavy stints super hard and see how much the degradation is on the tires. So maybe they're learning. I think that's one of the caveats you've got to take for the test. We spoke to Fred Vasseur on the, the final afternoon. I had a long, long 30 minutes chat with him um, in Ferrari. So quite a, quite a good thing for you know a change of atmosphere in Marinello. But he talked about some of the stints. You know, they've been experimented setups and that setup hadn't worked and therefore it hadn't looked very good. So I think sometimes it's quite hard if you're not actually inside the team when you see a bad stint go, oh, that car's terrible. Or actually, the team have done exactly what they wanted and they've addressed it. So I think he was happier with where they were on day three than where they were on day one and two. But I think one of the recurring themes from Ferrari was this balance, finding the right balance with the car. And I think there were times they, they couldn't quite get it in the, the sweet spot, which I think may be more, more critical now as we, we get into this kind of phase. There's not much performance difference at the front. And, and, and what is that, John, can you explain about how quick Ferrari were through uh, the speed traps, what that says about the power unit and the aero they were running at testing and why they'd be so quick in testing as well in a straight line? Yeah, I did, did a very quick basic analysis. I don't think my, my um, database and program is quite as good as Blake, but uh, from my, my basic thing, looking at the, the, that, those final laps on the final day, day three, when... Um, Ferrari, uh, Mercedes and Red Bull had done their, their fast laps. I mean, the Ferrari looked quick in a straight line. So it looked like they have addressed this e- e- efficiency, which wasn't one of their problems last year. However, how much that's compromised their performance in the corners, we aren't quite sure yet. So they've got to find that sweet spot and that balance. And Fred Vasseur talked about this, about approaching the race weekend, and you've got to make a compromise. Are you chasing top speed? Are you going to chase edge more towards downforce? And I think last year, I mean, Fred talked about Red Bull having gone very, very aggressive in going for the straight line speed, which, you know, proved critical in allowing Max to overtake, proved critical in letting him get away. People couldn't attack him. So, you know, maybe Ferrari are going to go more towards chasing the straight line speed at the consequence of corners um, and then try and leave your rivals to, to battle through and do something different to get ahead of you. All right, I, w- I want to make sure we have time for everything on Blake's list, but I think there's a lot we could talk about with Ferrari. But let's get into the next of the predicted front runners, and one that completely confused me because I was watching the the, the test, thinking, "Well, where are Mercedes?" The drivers were positive and negative. Uh, Toto Wolf said that a lot's been solved, and they were holding a lot back. Of course, they would do its testing. So, Blake, they had a really mixed test. But from your expert insight, what can you tell us? I, th- I think Mercedes weekend or their their test program looked a lot like the Ferrari. You know, they, they were minding their own business. They were gathering all the data, good mileage. Um, the low fuel runs looked good um, it, and their high fuel runs actually looked very good. But they, they lost a lot of time on day two with um, as far as I've read is just they lost a load of front load on the car and they were kind of scratching their heads day two evening and day three looked fine again. So. I think that might have put them a little bit on the back foot in terms of understanding because as 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 John was saying before, like the compromise and the balance, um, if the balance is way out of the window, it, you kind of are left scratching your head about the results. You know, was our, you know, for example, our pace or our degradation low because the car was understeering like a pig or was it fine? Um, from what I saw, their race pace and degradation looked better than the Ferrari on a handful of stints and you can you can pick and choose the data. 
The only thing I will say, which is, I, I agree 100% with what John said about the Ferrari being a very slippery car and potentially taking that approach where a bit more efficient, if you're not exactly leading outright in single lap performance in the race you're coming through and you're going to be d difficult to hang on to, I think Mercedes with the W14 still has a little bit of an efficiency problem from what I can see. They could have been running the engine modes low, but looking at all the other Mercedes powered cars, they were about where they were last season. So I don't feel like anything changed in that regard. It looks like the Mercedes still a little bit on the draggy side. Is it is it the Mercedes engine or is it just a carry on of their car and side pod philosophy as a whole? Uh, talking about that philosophy, you've got some analysis and content on your channel about that, how they surprised everyone at the second test last year. What would you, know, what would you have done given last year? Would you have made a call halfway through the year or when at, one, at whatever point and said, this philosophy hasn't worked, but then that puts you so much far behind your competitors or are they right to carry on with this and try and unlock the time, which they insist, if they can get this working, there's tenths in the car. Yeah. What would you have done? I, I think... I think they've done the right thing and they've listened to their experts. You know, it's one of those things you look back years in the past where maybe McLaren had gone on to a, a concept and it didn't pan out and they, they stuck, you know, very firmly on that path and it kind of fell away from them from there. But I, I think Mercedes is a kind of team that has not only the, the experience, but the depth and the expertise to, to make the right decisions on that. And if they're saying there's performance in this zero pod concept, and not only just the zero pod concept, I think, is what we talked about in that video was that and how the suspension and everything else and the window that people keep talking about of the car. So how much downforce is where, how t how narrow that window is, and then what happens when you move away from it. I, th I think with the new regulations, the floor edge is raised, sensitivity to porpoising hopefully reduced. I, I think they're saying, you know what, we can keep down this concept um, and adapt a little bit. Because, like you said, they are they are down a road quite far now. You know, we're a whole season in, um, and then there was you know six twelve months of development on that concept before it even showed up. So, I, I would have stuck it out honestly, because mm. I trust I trust them to make the right decisions on that. Yeah, they don't forget how to be world champions overnight. No, so exactly. The, all the people there to you know to win again. Yes. Um, John, you were there in the paddock. Uh, Blake's mentioned this kind of weird front end downforce issue on Saturday. I mean, the last thing a team wants is to not know what the car is doing and to be discovering that as you're two, three, four races into the season. Can you tell us any more about what happened there and what they found out? Well, I didn't didn't find an awful lot, I don't think. I was told that the following morning there was no kind of smoking gun, no obvious explanation as to what happened on day two. They did some set of experiments planned for day three, but as soon as they began running on day three, the car was in a much better place. So, I mean, it could be related to this. I mean, the... the the term you kept hearing from lots of teams was chasing balance, basically. I think with these new tyres, the way you need to look after them over a stint, a uh, tricky track as well, Bahrain, temperature fluctuations, track surface is quite rough. Uh, I think everyone was trying to get into the, the right window with a balance. And I think if you got slightly out of it, um, especially with these these new tyres being stronger on the front, potentially weaker on the rear, Max reckoned, actually. Max reckoned that the fronts were the same and it's the rears that were weaker. But... Um, We'll see see how that pans out, but I mean it could be related, you know, to slight wrong temperature, slight wrong balance, and it, the problem was exacerbated on the Mercedes. But it, it looked better um, by the final day. But and I agree with Blake about the efficiency. I think the Mercedes still needs more straight line speed. But they've already talked about a new side pod concept or a side pod update coming potentially around Baku time. I think so that may well address some of these straight line issues, and it'll be an area they hope can push on forwards with. That doesn't inspire confidence, though, does it, when they're talking about bringing significant upgrades based around the fundamentals, or is that, you're not bothered by that? Well, I think it's one of those things you can either view it as a glass half full or glass half empty, can't you, that they've either got a lot of performance coming, like the, you know, McLaren can say, we've got a big step coming for the car, or you could look at it as, <laughs> actually, we've messed this launch version up, and uh, we should have done a better job from race one. All right, Blake, let's talk about your fourth point that you wanted to bring up on today's video. Your former team, Red Bull, looked so solid in Bahrain. And that was what was really interesting, is that whatever run plan they seemed to do, Max seemed to bounce out the car. He seemed happy. Uh, it, it, there didn't seem to be any problems. But what, did, what was your take on Red Bull's test? I, I think having been at several of the tests in the winter, this looked like a really normal Red Bull test, albeit with much better reliability than the old engine days. So, I mean, they were running through their programs, a lot of hybrid runs, 
So you do, you know, a performance run at the beginning, come in, change the flap, go out and do a high fuel run. And they were getting through lots of test items, covering lots of mileage. And I'm not a body language expert. But when, you see, when you see the drivers hop out of the car, you know, Max doing his Max explaining with the hands and everything to, <laughs> to the engineers. So it, it looked it looked good. But, um, but I, I'm not a body language expert. I, I like looking at data. And from what I can see, again, we go back to this point. If you're at the top of the timesheets, it doesn't necessarily mean anything good. So... Uh, but let, let's be off the back of last season. That car was a rocket ship. Um, that DNA is still in this car. It looks like an evolution of the last year's car, potentially a little bit better. They were very, very good on the tires, especially in the evening in the cooler stints. So, you know, in the in the in the morning when they put high fuel in the car, it wasn't too bad. It was in the mix. Uh, definitely not Ferrari look. But we again, we don't know if they were pushing like hell or or what they were doing. But the Red Bull looks like it's good on the tires. It's Checo's lap on day three. The car looked like it was on rails. I had to stop and go back and rewind it and say, is that an outlap? Because it was, you know, it was, it was planted in the high speed. There was no corrections, you know, just losing the rear tires just a little bit at the end of the lap, which, which as you were saying before, is very typical of, of Bahrain. You know, it's very high on a traction. The rear tires are going to go away through a lap, especially on those softer compounds. But degradation looks good. Uh, there's no reason to be alarmed at the pace. I think Red Bull are going to uh, lead the start of the season. Can you just explain a little bit for someone like me uh, uh, this incredible uh, analysis that you do of, of the data from testing? But when when we look at what you're looking at, how can you tell on a long run pace uh, that they had so little degradation? What are the things that you're pulling out of those data to make that conclusion? Well, I, th- I think this is probably one of the most like the simple forms that you're literally just looking at their lap times. And one of the one of the good things about let's say when a team does a race simulation is they can't sandbag it or they can't put because if they're going out stopping for new tires and out you you know how much fuel you started with you probably started with close to full tanks so and if you're looking at the lap time that they lose per lap and you see this you know um we'll get on to the other one which is super interesting but the, the, the example we go back to is mexico last year when people like max was doing the exact same lap time for an entire stint that is the the characteristic description of very low deg which is either which is very likely the fact that they have so much pace in hand that they can slow down so that they're not damaging the tire so they don't lose any lap time every single lap. You're just going faster and faster. And as if you're, bullying, as if you're burning off that fuel, um, you're taking advantage of that couple hundreds of a second from that lap's worth of fuel. Brilliant. Uh, John, can you explain for people watching, and you know, I've seen some comments over the last few days that, yeah, in previous years we've been at tests during Mercedes' dominance era, where they have sandbagged a bit, and and we've looked at the data, and that's led us to conclude actually maybe Ferrari are a bit uh, a bit stronger than previous years, and then Mercedes have come out and just and just dominated. So it's understandable for then people to say, look, Autosport for the last few days have been saying Red Bull are favourites. Are they nailed on favourites? Are we confident with that? You know, a week is a long time in Formula One before they go racing again this weekend. Uh, yeah, I think you wouldn't find anyone in that paddock who wouldn't deny that Red Bull are favourites. It just looked, and it goes beyond the lap times. Um, I think it's the, the way in which Max was Max and Sergio were so able to extract pace. I mean, you look to his runs on, Max's runs on day one, for example. There was a, you know, a few insulation laps in the morning and straight into a programme. Runs of six, seven laps, all consist, super consistent, all the same thing, come in for a wing change, back out again, six, seven laps, same pace, bang. So there's none of this kind of struggling to maintain consistency, none of this ver- huge variations in performance, no massive drop-off in tyre wear, just it seemed seemed easy. And I think that's the that's the concern of other teams. It, it didn't seem an effort for Red Bull to put these lap times in either the shorter runs, the race distances, the, the final low fuel runs. It all looked quite effortless. So the key is how much are they pushing and how much have they still got in their pocket? Yeah, oh man, I can't wait to see them this weekend. You know, Max Verstappen uh, boxed into a corner it is is a, is fierce when he comes out fighting, but a confident double world champion Max Verstappen that looks as you know just as at ease. Well, that's ominous as well because who knows uh, how how uh, how far ahead they they might be, or how much the other teams could be sandbagging, and who's gonna. Who's going to challenge them? Blake, your fifth point you sent us, I'm so pleased you put this on your list, is you want to talk about Aston Martin. Uh, 
I've been really impressed by them, and then I've been told I'm both too bullish on them, <laughs> and that uh, and that they won't be anywhere near you know Mercedes come come uh, Q3. But what are your thoughts on Aston Martin? It's it's another one of those things. It's like they're up towards the front in the rankings every day, minding their own business. Um, their single lap pace looks okay. Nothing great. Like, if I had to guess, it was probably around fourth, which means it could be, you know, plus or minus one from there. I was, you know, Alonso put in the really good lap on, was it day one, really close to the Red Bull, thinking, okay, could They've got a good car. They've got Fernando Alonso in the car. Great. Um, and then on day three, they did the race stint, which is what everybody was talking about. And we talked about low degradation, but there's another thing which we haven't talked about is negative degradation, whereas the more laps you do, the faster the tire goes. And Alonso did a race stint, which did exactly that, which, you know, if you look at the first lap, you know, it was it was a fast lap already. And then the stint got faster. The next stint, the exact same thing. And then the final stint at low fuel, the exact same thing. So that's, again, one of those things that's super difficult to fake because you have to have the fuel in the car to do the lap. And there's no way, like looking at the, the the speeds and everything else, there's no way that you you know they're playing tricks with the engine. So I'm kind of bullish about Aston Martin as well, but it's one of those things. Like I don't know. I'm, this takes me back to a story of a long time ago at Force India. There's a, a test we did, and Hulkenberg did a what they called it the mega lap. We spent a lot of time trying to understand exactly you know because it was a, a brilliant lap that stood out way beyond any other lap, and it was what is that? But I. Is, this isn't a single lap. This is a whole race simulation. So I think the Aston Martin genuinely do have a solid race car. We'll we'll see come next Saturday where their um, or this Saturday where their race pay, or their qualifying pace is. But I'm, it was impressive, and it's hard to fake that. And if anyone can pull performance out of a car, it's going to be Fernando Alonso. As a as a former performance engineer working with drivers. On a test weekend, now Alonso arrived too late to have direct feed in. You know to feed into the the fundamental design of, of this car but what will his performance engineer what's that role over a weekend he's new to the team he's putting in some fantastic performances he's lost his his teammate stroll to an injury and so he's you know he's not on his own because Drogovic will be providing feedback there but what's that role of, of the performance engineer in the team of getting the most out of uh, Alonso because Alonso wants to get the most out of the car yeah I, I think a lot of that will be looking at your other references that you've got like it's really difficult to compare back to another year and so you had Drogovic in the morning doing the test plan. I think the performance and race engineer would have been just literally looking at that, trying to, I mean, of, of course, Alonso's done some runs in the simulator, so they're familiar with his feedback, what he wants from the car and what he doesn't want from the car. But I think that that first day with the performance and race engineer was just looking at the data, understanding what he needs from the car and giving him exactly that. Because, you know, comparing a driver to yourself is quite difficult. You, you know, you, usually you're comparing driver A to driver B and saying, right, here's what we can do. You know, we, all the teams have all the telemetry data or the subset of telemetry data from all the other teams. But you can't really compare that. You can't say, you know, Alonzo, the Red Bull's doing this here. Can you do that? So day day one with Alonzo would have been about uh, getting the feedback, understanding what he needed from the car and getting the balance where he wanted it so that he could extract the most out of it. And potentially at this point, they might be learning a bit from him. Wow. John, you know, I'm, I'm fully on board the Aston Martin hype train. I've got my ticket. <laughs> I've sat down. I'm here for the ride. Are you? Am I stupid for doing that? What's your take? I think there's been a step forward, definite. But the question is, how, how far has it gone? That, that day three run from Alonso was sensational. I mean, it, it, you know, one of the most impressive runs we saw from anybody throughout the three days. But there are some caveats to it. First is, you know, track conditions, temperature changes a lot during the test. So if you get to do it in the cooler temperatures then you know your performance can look a lot better than if you're doing it in the, the, the glaring midday heat. The other factor was, from what the team was saying, was that at the time Fernando was doing these runs, everyone else was going out on soft tyres, doing um, quali runs, quali simulation runs. So the track was getting well rubbered in with a softer compound, which they think helped elevate the performance a little bit. So it could explain why it was maybe may have been an outlier, but... You know, whether I, th- I think we may be getting ahead of ourselves thinking Aston can be battling up there with Ferrari and Red Bull, but... I think it's a definite step. And with Fernando, you never know. I mean, he's a he's a wily old fox who's been around the block many, many, many times. And we talked about body language earlier, and I thought it was fascinating that Fernando, when he knows the team's in trouble, he'll give some speech about why he's doing a sensational job and all this sort of thing. If he thinks there's, you know, he's elevating himself above the team, there'll be even more stuff about, I'm the best prepared I am, I'm the best 
this weekend, completely calm, complete silence, absolutely nothing, giving absolutely nothing away, playing everything down, which to me is the biggest indication that he knows he's got a, a very good car underneath him. All right, here we go. That's your top five talking points, Blake. Thank you so much for joining us. I uh, hope it's not the last time you join us on the channel because I've learned so much today. Quickly, in terms of overall competition this year, what were your key takeaways from testing then? I think the, the most exciting thing that I think everybody would be glad to hear is the field looks closer together. We've had a year on these regulations under the belts. Uh, the teams who were struggling with the weight problem in last year um, have, itched, you know, have scratched that deficit away. I think we're looking for, like, the midfield battle is going to be fantastic this year. Do, will Red Bull and Ferrari be leading this? Maybe. Um, but you've got Aston elevated. Alpine, hopefully, with a lot more to show than they brought to the test. I think this is going to be a sensational year for, for race fans. Yeah, it sounds that it, it, like, John, if, there, if there's any change at the front, if, I don't know, if Verstappen and, and Leclerc go into, the, into T1 and take each other off, then it, it it's opens it up to so many more drivers that could be on the podium or the top step. How do you think to get, how do you think things will shake out this weekend and these this first four set of flyaway races? Yeah, I think we're gonna have a, a kind of maybe a season of two halves. I think the, the first four races are gonna be fairly static in terms of the order. I think you'll you'll have Red Bull and Ferrari at the front. And potentially it could be similar to last year. Ferrari quicker in qualifying, Red Bull comes through in the race. Uh, and maybe Ferrari will try and mitigate that by you know, increasing the efficiency, trying to trying to stop Max blasting past them on the straights. Um, but then I think as we get on to seasons, the McLaren upgrades come forward, the Mercedes changes come for potentially Baku, more upgrades come. Hopefully that, that pack gets close onto the back of them and we can have it mixed up. Because it wasn't very good last year to have one, you know, non-McLaren, non-Mercedes, Red Bull, Ferrari on the podium. Um, we need more, we need more people up there. So let's hope, let's hope it moves forward. All right. Thank you, John. Blake, thank you so much. We enjoyed that. That was brilliant. Can we? Can you come back soon? Absolutely. John, Martin, thank you so much for having me. I had a blast speaking with you guys today. I look forward to oh, it. Thank you, guys, for watching and listening to this. If you liked us, uh, the content that we're making over this preseason, uh, give us a thumbs up so we know you like it. We'll make more like it. Make sure you subscribe as well to Blake's uh, various channels, uh, from his main channel to he's got uh, podcast and gaming. It's uh, Break F1 with his three R's. And make sure you subscribe to us as well. Uh, and though you never miss a video that we'll make. We'll be back this weekend. <sighs> Just time to catch our breath after a thrilling pre-season as we head into the first race this weekend of the F1 Championship season. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on the next one.